1 John 1, 5. This is a message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Would you say God is light? No darkness at all. I think it's, it's prudent, at least we forget, at least we forget, church, that there are only two kingdoms, only two kingdoms. I know it's a very complex world. In fact, I was talking to a reporter. We've had a, a number ring lately, obviously. And, and um, you know, he was asking what sort of credentials or training do pastors have? You know, now, you know my story. God called me into this. And, you know, it wasn't because I was intelligent or trained or anything like that. I did go to Bible college, but it was a call of God. And, um, of course, growing up, there weren't the problems that are around today. I mean, I could talk about mental health, but other problems. And uh, today, as you know, even doctors and psychologists don't have all the answers for people. Some people's lives are very messed up. That is why suicide is so high, right? And so as pastors, it's not like, you know, we are psychologists or doctors, although some of them may, may be. I mean, Kim is kind of up there. But enough to say that, that we're here just to talk about Jesus and to minister Jesus and to believe for Jesus to, if people are prepared to turn to Him, to fix up their mess like He fixed up my mess, right? And, uh, and so I know life is comp complex today and that's not uh, belittling it, but there are no longer absolutes in the world, that is. It's like shades of grey. Shades of grey abound everywhere. For example, and I'm not going there, but for example, once there was male and female, now there's a whole alphabet in between. And the Bible is very clear. There's only two paths, two eternities, two realms, and those realms are darkness and light. Darkness and light. There's no grey. So it's like all roads do not lead to Rome as far as the kingdom is concerned. Let's read 2 Corinthians 6.14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship is righteousness with lawlessness? Notice two things, righteousness and lawlessness. Look at lawlessness abounding around the world right now. Ram raids. I mean, not only in America, but also here in New Zealand. You know it. What communion has light with darkness? What accord is Christ with Baal, Christ and the devil? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Two people. And what agreement is a temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. I was speaking at Equip, which is our leadership session just the other week, and I was talking about how the church is under attack. But listen, my friend, it's nothing new. The church has been under attack from the day it was born. I mean, they tried to silence the church back then. Nero even tried to take out the church. China's tried to take out the church. Many leaders have tried to take out the church. But the church, hallelujah, I'm here to tell you, will not only survive, but thrive. Praise the Lord. And I'll tell you why in a moment. And so even though the church is under attack, I want to talk about the importance of the church. I don't know whether you do it. I, I do it all the time. And even though I know better, Bev and I are driving along and, and uh, maybe going up to Whangarei or riding on the bike or whatever. And, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll see a nice little building in, in, in the paddock and we say, look at that neat little church over there. We all do it, right? We call a building a church. I mean, it even could be a cathedral. You've been to some of these places where they have these massive cathedrals. But in actual fact, you know and I know better than that, the church is actually about God and people. We are living stones being built up into a holy tabernacle. Now this morning, I do have a number of scriptures to read and I do not apologize for it. I'm, I'm not really one of those preachers, although I have done it. You know, you read one text and then you tell everybody what you think about that text. I want the Word of God to speak to you today. And so I've got a number of scriptures and I hope and pray that you would follow me. And I just love the Word of God because it abides forever. Amen. And so 1 Peter 2, 4, coming to Him as living stone. Living stone, rejecting, uh, sorry, rejected indeed by men, but chosen. Some of you have been through some things, I know, but chosen by God. I know that we choose Him in the sense that we put up our hand and say, God, here I am, but He chooses you. He chooses you. He, if you're here this morning, God has chosen you. Hallelujah, what an honour and a privilege. And chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house. Would you say a spiritual house? The church is a spiritual entity. 
It's not a dead, dumb church. It's about God and people. A holy priesthood to offer up what? Spiritual sacrifices. Acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I know when we come to church, we meet our friends, we have coffee, we, you know, we, but it's not about that. We're here to offer up spiritual sacrifices. We're here to do business with God, amen? Now I want you to know, there's two other incredible descriptions of the church, and you need to be reminded of this, that we are the church, we are the bride of Christ. Wow. I said the bride of Christ. We are also the body of Christ. In other words, We're a living building, a living body, a living bride. The church is not dead, but the church is a living organism. Now, the world, listen now, from a biblical perspective, is way more spiritual than what you and I give it credence, or particularly what other people give it credence of. It's more spiritual than many people perceive. I mean, I often say, you are more of a spirit being than a a physical being. Your spirit is going to live forever. Your body, that which we see and spend so much time and emphasis on, is going to go to the grave, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. I know you're wanting to put it off as long as you can, but the reality is your spirit will live forever. So you are a spiritual being living in a dirt bag. Now, some may be better looking dirt bags than others, but you're still a dirt bag. Your body is made up of minerals of the earth, right? But especially in our Western world, our Western culture, we tend to be very carnal. We tend to be very fleshly orientated. I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to you. Obviously, I know in the church, you know, sometimes it can be gossip and bad attitudes and jealousy and unforgiveness. Those sort of things should not exist in a church. But I'm talking about other natural things, even the building. I was saying to Pastor Joe, I said, Joe, I said, there's so many things that you as lead pastor can get caught up in and the pressure will come to get caught up because I know what it's like. So many natural things, room allocation, finance, so many natural things. But I said, Pastor Joe, the church You must get away with God and spend time with God because the church is about God and people. It's not about the natural things. So the fact is, whether people recognize it or not, the world is a very spiritual place and the church is a spiritual entity. I mean, the heavens are spiritual, right? You've got angels and demons. You've got powers and principalities. And so the church is called Ecclesia, the called out ones. What are you and I called out from? What are we called out from? Well, Ephesians tells us, him who called you out of what? Darkness and into not just light, but marvelous light. Isaiah 61, talking about the last days, arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you, for behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness is levels of darkness. And deep darkness of people, but the Lord will arise over you, and His glory will be seen on you, and the Gentiles will come to what? Your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Now, if I was to mention darkness to you this morning, What would you immediately think of? I mean, darkness. Now, of course, I've alluded to it today, but normally you'd probably think, oh, close your eyes. Close your eyes. If you close your eyes in this place, well, particularly for me on the platform, I can still see light, even with my eyes closed. Maybe you think when you switch out your bedroom light, you know, but normally, like me, you've got a radio clock beside your bed, so when you wake up in the night, you know what time it is, whether it's time to get up or not. Or a little nightlight to help you to the bathroom. No, I'm just kidding. But in any case, welcome to your future. No, but, or maybe, maybe it's dark in a tunnel. Turn out your headlights. I've been in, I've been in a caving experience deep in the cave and it's so deep, it's like, you can't, you know, it's pitch black. They say pitch black. You can't see your hand in front of your face. And often we think of natural darkness. Why? Because we all, too often think naturally. 
And yet I want to talk to you this morning about biblical darkness and biblical light. What true darkness is. Darkness, number one, you can make a note, but darkness is a person. We have the prince of darkness, the prince of darkness. Now, Ephesians 6.10, let's just read from verse 12. It talks about putting on the armour of God, but it says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers. Against powers, we'll look at it. Against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Now, just like God is light, Jesus, I'm the light of the world, light is a person, darkness is also. Interesting that Satan is known and referred to as a prince eight out of 11 times in the New Testament. Christ is only referred to a prince three times. In Acts 3, the prince of life. Acts 5, the prince and saviour, Jesus Christ. And in Revelation, the prince of kings. But of course, listen to me, Jesus is also known as a king. A king is higher than a prince, right? He was known as a king at his birth. The wise men came and they said, where's the king that we might worship him? Even at his trial, Pilate said, are you a king? And he said, yes, I am. Above us on the cross, Jesus, the king of the Jews. In Revelation, it talks about Jesus known as a king of kings. The only thing that comes close for Satan is when he's known as Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies. But Satan is known as a prince three times, the prince of this world, three, four times the prince of devils <laughs> and demons, and the prince of the power of the air. Now, I'm talking about two kingdoms, light and darkness. I'm talking about two princes, prince of light and prince of darkness. So not only is darkness a person, but number two, darkness is a power, a power, a power. Acts 26, 18. Now I send you, in verse 18, Paul is here on the road to Damascus and because he has an angelic visitation to open the eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power, but he say the power. Power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And so when we go through these eight Ps, and I didn't come up with them all, by the way. I'm not that clever, but I, I built on it. Uh, power and a person. Darkness is also a preference, a preference. In John 3, verse 14, talking about the great verse, for God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son. But it also says in verse 19, look at it. For this is a condemnation that the light has come into the world. Look at this, look at this, look at this. The men love darkness rather than the light. They chose darkness rather than the light. Everybody here has got to make a choice. Because their deeds were evil, for everyone who practices evil hates the light <laughs> and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. So darkness is a preference. Darkness is also a place, a place. Matthew 8, 12. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into where? Out of darkness, that place of darkness. There'll be weeping and mashing teeth. That's mentioned three times in Matthew chapter 8, 22, 25. Now there's a reason I'm telling you all this and I'll get to it, but stay with me. And in Jude 1, 13, it talks about wandering stars for whom is reserved, look at this, the blackness of darkness. There's levels of darkness. There's a darkness that can be felt. Darkness is a place. Darkness, number five, is also a penetration. In other words, it penetrates. And what does it penetrate? People. Matthew 6, 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is good, the whole body is full of light. We'll talk about how light penetrates you. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. I've met people and I've looked in their eyes and you can see some darkness in there. Jesus said the eye is the window of the soul. What do people see when they look in your eyes? If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Darkness penetrates. It's a penetration. Number six, darkness is also a path. A path. He who walks in darkness. Let's have a look at a couple of scriptures because the Bible says in two or three scriptures, let everything be established. So I want to share this with you, not just making it up. Is that all right? 
1 John 2, 11, He who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness, walks in darkness and does not know where he is going <laughs> because the darkness has blinded his eyes. 1 John 1, 6, no wonder Jesus, the, you know, there was not one person in the Old Testament that had ever been healed of blindness until Jesus came. And yet that was the most miracles that he did was to heal people of blindness. The disciples went on to do many miracles, lame people, even raise the dead. But maybe you can find it where a disciple cured a blind person. And that was the number one miracle of Christ. Darkness has blinded their eyes. First John 1 John 1.6, there's none so blind as those who can't see. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. John 8.12, Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. So darkness is a path. You walk in darkness, but Jesus said you can have the light of life. And so darkness is also productivity. Productivity, what I'm talking about. There's works of darkness. Romans 13, 12. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Darkness produces something. We'll see that it is a producer. We'll talk about the fruit of it in a moment. But at the moment, we're talking about the works of darkness and that produces a bad fruit, right? And so cast off the works of darkness. And you know the works of darkness and the fruit of darkness. I, I don't need to go into them. But in Galatians 5, you talk about the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of darkness. Let us put on the armour of light, 5.11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. So not only are there works of darkness, but they're unfruitful. But rather expose them, for it is even shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever was, makes manifest is light. No wonder the world cannot understand the church. No wonder the world can't understand born again believers. Because it's a spiritual thing. And the Bible says it's foolishness to the world, right? It's foolish that we should be here on a Sunday morning. It's foolishness to bring our offerings into the house of the Lord. It's foolishness to line up people and lay hands on them and pray. The world doesn't understand that. But hallelujah, when you're born again, you're born into another kingdom. And all of a sudden the light is switched on, the penny drops. And we are spiritual people. Darkness is a producer. Jesus said you will know them by their fruit, right? And every good tree <laughs> produces good fruit and every bad tree produces bad fruit. Now, I've known what it's like to be a bad tree. I was such a once a messed up person that God told me very clearly through a prophetic word. I mean, it was like, like, like just like a, I mean, just incredible. I was a tree in the garden. It was when I was struggling as a new Christian, struggling with repentance, struggling from leaving my old life behind. I had so many bad habits, m mindsets, and some of you know what that's like. And for three years, it was like I was trying to get up a mountain and I couldn't. I knew that that was a way, but I couldn't get there. It was like one foot up and one foot backward, two backwards. And I was struggling, struggling in life from a messed up past. And God, I, was, I came to a meeting and this guy said, there's a man here and if he doesn't come forward, it's gonna be too late for him. And I didn't sense anything. Another young man walked forward and, and the prophet from overseas said, it's not you. How do you think he felt? <laughs> and when he said, it's not you, the Spirit of God fell on me. I was probably in the middle of the, just a young 22 year old, something like that. And the Spirit of God fell on me and I just began to weep and he said, it's you. And he said, you've been a tree planted for three years. I've been a Christian for three years. And he said, the Lord's about to cut you down. That's what happened in the Bible, right? But he said, Jesus is gonna manure you for a year. And if you bear fruit, well and good. But if you don't, you'll be thrown onto the fire. The fear of God came upon me. I knew I had to get my act together. I'm here by the grace of God today. 
I've known what it's like to produce bad fruit in my life. Bev and I were watching the news just last night, watching some people down in Levin going through that horrendous time with the, with the hurricane, you know, the tornado. And a couple of people, and I said, you know, some people have got so messed up in life. They've developed habits and character. And I'm glad I came to the Lord when I was younger and not when I was 50 or 60, living a lifetime of producing bad fruit. But the, the, God's still able to work in your life no matter how old you are. Ephesians 5.8. For you were once in darkness. Now I know we've got some pretty good people here being brought up Christians their whole life and you may not relate to that, but I know every sinner here can put up their hand and say, yeah, we were once in darkness. Have, have I got any friends in the house or have I just got all religious people here? I'm just asking the question. You can never afford to throw stones at people. You can never afford to point your finger at people. For where you were once in darkness, but now light of the, in the Lord, walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the light is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. The fruit of the light, proving what is well pleasing unto the Lord and have no fellowship. You gotta repent, you gotta put some things behind you. I was trying to live my foot in both camps. Have you tried to live in both camps? As one wise boatman said, if you've got a foot on the dock and the foot in the boat, sooner or later you're gonna end up a very sorry person. A person with one foot in the church and one foot in the world, you'll end up a very messed up person. It doesn't work. The only way <laughs> is to be all in. Take up your cross daily. And it says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Notice the fruit of the light, but in darkness is the unfruitful works. So darkness is a producer. Romans 6.21, when you were slaves of sin, <laughs> you were free Slaves of sin. Do you know in Second Peter, there are chains of darkness. Chains of darkness. Darkness will hold you a prisoner. See, we think of chains, we think of natural chains. Think of dungeons, think of irons and so forth. But there are spiritual chains. Chains of darkness. But do you know there's someone who can set you free? His name is Jesus, hallelujah. Prison bars can't do it. Psychologists even can't do it. You know, Jesus. See, a lot of things are, are spiritual. I'm not saying everything's a demon, but I tell you, I've known what it's like to fight some demons. Unfruitful works of darkness. Romans 6.21. For you were slaves of sin, but you are free you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? <laughs> For the end of those things is death. Man, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. Can you tell me anything more important than that? For the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now I know we're all still working out our salvation daily with fear and trembling. We're saved when we're born again. Hallelujah. We are being saved. And then the Bible talks about a salvation that is yet to be revealed. We're all in the process. None of us is perfect. I talked about Samson, did I not? I talked about Peter and I talked about some others. Every one of us have been messed up to a lesser or bigger degree. Am I talking to anybody today or if some people got too religious on me? I don't know. Fruit of darkness are listed in Galatians 5 along with the fruit of the Spirit. So we could say not only darkness is a person, a power, a preference, a place, a penetration, a path and productivity and a producer. Therefore, darkness is a problem. P, get it? In fact, it's a huge problem because the wages of sin is death. Sin's a sucker. Sin will always take you further than what you want to go. Sin will suck the very life out of you. I was talking to a lady just last week and, you know, you could tell she'd been around. Sin will make you look old at 40. That's why Greg looks so good at 50. Now for the good news. And thank God there's good news for the believer, for the follower of Christ, for those who are prepared to open up their heart and let the light in. 
See, those eight darknesses, it's like a bleak, bleak thing of your past. But listen now, past, get it, P? But our present <laughs> and future is as bright as light. Colossians 1.13, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of His Son, of His love. Ephesians 5, For you were once in darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light for the fruit of the Spirit. You read it, all goodness, righteousness and truth. So my point to highlight, oh Peter, come on. To highlight, my point of all this, to highlight, to magnify, to shout aloud, to remind us about the work of the church. The work of the church and the importance of the church. See, it's not a natural work, it's a supernatural work. It's not a worldly work, it's a heavenly work. It's not a temporal work, it's an eternal work. It's not an insignificant work, it's the most important work one can lend a hand to. I know from Monday to Friday, whatever you do in life is important, I get it. Families are important, I get it. Sport's important, I get it. Everything else and education, it's all important, I get it. But at least we forget. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And so the work of the church, of the Christians, Monday to Friday, not just on Sunday, is so important because it's eternal work. Everything else is temporal. 2 Timothy 1.10, But now has appeared, revealed by the appearing of our Saviour Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So there are only two kingdoms, two realms, light and darkness. One leads to life, the other is a destruction. 1 Thessalonians 5.4. Are you with me today? But you, brethren, are not of the darkness. I'm talking to believers here this morning. And if you're not yet a believer, the light can come on in your life like it came on mine. So that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. But not of the night nor of the darkness. Matthew 5.14. You are the light of the world. 1 Peter 2.9, but you, say me, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, man, that you may proclaim the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God who have named, obtained mercy, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So darkness, as I said, is a person, in power. you know, Star Wars got it right. The force be with you. The power of darkness, Darth Vader and all that kind of stuff, right? What's the other guy's name on the good side? Luke Skywalker. Okay. Won't bring him into it. It's a preference, a place, a penetration, a path of productivity and therefore a problem. But light is the solution to the problem. Number one, we're going very quickly this morning. Light is a person. Simply put, in 1 John 1, 5, God is light. Everybody say that, God is light. God is also love, God is also life. Jesus said in John 8, 12 and 9, 5, I am the light of the world. Light is a person. In John 1, 4, I'm giving you a few scriptures to back up what I'm saying this morning so you know I'm not making this up. In Him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness. The darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from John, whose name, sorry, sent from God, whose name was John. This man came for a witness to be a witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not the light. John the Baptist wasn't the light, but he sent to be a witness of that light. Talking about Jesus, that is a true light. Do you know if you've got a true light, you can also have a false light. Jesus is a true light. The devil can appear as an angel of light. He's a false light. The true light gives light to every man. That false light will take people into darkness. Light is a person. Light is also a power. Matthew 26, verse 64. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Henceforth you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. Who's at Jesus' right hand? God the Father. Power. 
power coming in clouds of heaven. In Revelation 1.16 he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. You and I, and I know, living in New Zealand, if you go outside with the with the uh, without sunscreen, you can only probably I don't know last of you know half an hour or so, an hour, particularly as you get a bit bolder. But anybody here know the problem? Greg knows the problem. <laughs> Notice I didn't pick on Charlie Russell this morning. He's way past it. He knows he wears a cap outside all the time now. I don't look good in caps, but I'm starting to wear them. Hallelujah. My wife likes me in a, in a Panama hat. She thinks I look like George Clooney in it. I'm just saying. I'm just, just saying. Particularly with a white shirt on. But the sun shining in its strength, that's pretty bright. Hebrews 1.3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. 1 Corinthians 4.20, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power, power, power. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of power. Light is a preference. You know, I, I talked about how men choose the darkness rather than the light, but in verse 21 of that, it says, but he who comes to the truth comes to the light. It's like choose this day. And if you're here this morning, you've got to choose today. Choose this day whom you will serve. I love Deuteronomy 31. It's quite a classic, really. God lays out all the curses. There's a lot of them for following darkness. And, and then all the, the blessings of following light, you know. And, and then, he, then, then, then he says, choose. And then he says, choose life. It's like we're so thick, you know. I mean, He just wants to help us so much. He gives us the answer. I mean, you'd have to be pretty foolish not to choose when you look at those two lists. But He just says, go on. Okay, I, I don't know. I, I smile every time I read it. I think, Lord, you're so good. It's like, you know, okay, all right. We read in John 3, as I said, men love darkness. So it's a preference. But you can love the light. It's a preference. Light is a place, my fourth point. The kingdom of God, a kingdom of light. In Revelation, it says there's no more need for the sun because God will be its light. Let's have a look. Revelation 21 verse 3, 23. The city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it for the glory of God has illuminated it. The lamp, the lamb, who's the lamb? It's not a trick question, Jesus. Is its light and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory and honour to it. So light is a place. Light is also penetration. The lamp of the body in Luke 11 verse 34, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. Penetrates you. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body is full of light as the bright shining of a lamp gives light. Number six, light is a path. Just moving along. First John 2, verse, 2, verse 10. Do you mind me reading the Scriptures? It's probably too bad if you, if you do, but... First John 2, 10. He who loves his brother abides in the light. And there's no cause for stumbling in him. In other words, you don't stumble around in the dark. First John 1, 7. If we walk in the light, it's a path. As He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus' Son cleanses us from all sin. Light is also just moving along. Is a productivity. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill, church, cannot be hidden. We don't need to be ashamed of the gospel. We don't have to go into hiding just because people write things or say things. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. It's a productivity of light and glorify your Father in Him. On Community Day, we've got an opportunity to shine our light. 2 Peter 1, 9, 1, 19. I see Steve sitting down there. I just thought of the Warriors yesterday. We lost by a couple of points. Was, oh, more than a couple, actually. Um, 2 Peter 1, 19. And so we have a prophetic word confirmed. Amazing what goes through your mind when you're preaching the word. 
So we have a prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the right morning star. I love it. The morning star rises in your heart. It is beautiful, Chris. Number eight, last one. Light is a producer, a producer. Ephesians 5.8, remember the works of darkness, the fruit of darkness. For you were once of darkness, but you are of the light. And the Lord walk as children of the light for the fruit. Everybody say the fruit of the Spirit. We read it is all goodness, righteousness and truth. Romans 2.19, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who walk in darkness. In other words, church, listen now. How important is the church? Bringing many sons to glory. There's no more important work than what the church does on the earth. Don't ever let people belittle the church. Acts 13, 47, for so, and I'm nearly through, so, for so the Lord commands us, I have set you, not only City Impact Church, but every church, I name some in New Zealand, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you shall be uh, for salvation to the ends of the earth. So light is a producer not only of good things in our own lives, but in the lives of other people. So just as darkness is those eight Ps that I talked about, a person, a power, a preference, a place, a penetration, a path, a productivity, producer, so is light. And just like darkness is a great problem, hallelujah, light is of great profit. First Thessalonians 5.5, 5, you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We're not of the dark night, nor are we of darkness. 1 John 2.8, again, a new commandment I write to you, which this, the, sorry, the, oh man, I'm just getting so excited about the word and I gotta wrap it up. Which thing is true in him and you because the darkness is passing away and true light is already shining. Man, I tell you, I know deep darkness is covering the earth. I know the world's getting very messed up out there. And I love, because I've been talking to you as a church about being awake at this hour, lifting up your head because your redemption draws nigh not sleeping or slumbering in this hour particularly. And Ephesians 5.14 says, Therefore he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. I got two other short scriptures I got to read to you. Is that all right? 1 Timothy 6.15 he who is blessed and the only pontinate, and I probably pronounced that wrong. How do you say it? Did I get it right? Thank you. Probably at my age, I should have it right by now. The King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone, listen now, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be the glory and the everlasting power. Amen.